Hi there everybody, welcome to the Marble Arch Caves Geopark, right here on the border between Fermanagh and Cavan. My name's Les Brown, I'm a hydrogeologist and I'm part in a citizen science group and we're doing a lot of water tracing in this area to determine where the groundwater flows in the limestone in this part of the world. Now for those of you familiar with the, the area around here, you'll notice that the area is quite famous for its caves and its shake holes, uh, stream sinks and resurgences. Now I've been involved in this project for quite a while and the aim of the project is to work out where those streams that sink underground drain to. We've been working here for the last few years and it's built upon work that's been going on for the last 20 or 30 years. So it's taken a long time but we still are determining where all these underground pathways go to. The summit ridge of Kilka Mountain forms a border between counties Fermanagh and Cavan. This photograph is taken from the Fermanagh side and here we're looking southwards towards the ridge and it's pretty clear you can see out a number of cliffs uh, along the length of the ridge. Uh, these are sandstone cliffs and they're quite substantial. Some of them are 40 and 50 meters in height. The middle slopes are mostly made of shales interbedded with sandstones as we come down towards the lower slopes we're on limestone now the limestone in this part of Kolka um, is quite characteristic in the cast landforms that it has in the foreground of the photograph here you can see some nice limestone pavement and just a bit further back you can see a number of enclosed depressions or dough lines and these are points of recharge where surface water sinks underground into the aquifer. Now, in addition to the, the dough lines and enclosed depressions in the area, we have quite a large number of potholes, steep sided shafts that go up to 50 meters into the limestone aquifer. This one, which is Pigeon Pot, is a 30 meter deep pothole. And just to the right of the cave there, you can see some water sinking um, underground. Now, this photograph was taken in the summer. If this photograph was taken in the winter, you'd see an absolute torrent of water cascading in a waterfall into the cave system below. This pothole has been one where we've been undertaking quite a significant number of dye traces. Uh, this trace was first undertaken by John Gunn in 1994, and he proved that this particular stream sink drained to multiple horizons in the Kulka cast and most notably it drained to Shannon Pot Rising, the source of the Shannon, which is 11 kilometers west of this site. Um, that trace has been repeated multiple times over the years and the Shannon Cave system, which we'll be talking about shortly, is the route that that water takes to get to Shannon Pot Rising. This is a generalized geology map of the Kulka area with the limestone area highlighted in white as, as it forms the lower slopes of the mountain, uh, locally known as the, the Marbank area. Underlying the limestone, we have shales that form the valley floors and overlying the limestone, we have a sequence of sandstones and shales that become increasingly sandstone dominant the further you go up the ridge. Now, cave exploration has a long history in the Kilk area with the first caving exploration being undertaken over 100 years ago. Um, particularly through the 70s, 80s and 90s, there was a lot of exploration and a lot of cave systems were extended and new systems were discovered. The most famous caves in the area would be the Marble Arch and Cascades cave system. And this is the longest cave system in Northern Ireland. The potholes I showed earlier in the presentation of pigeon pots are located here on the east. Shannon Cave is in the central southern area of the Marlbank area. And it's important to recognize that Shannon is a little bit unusual in that although it's formed in the limestone aquifer, it does go underneath the overlying sandstone cap. And this means that for large parts of Shannon Cave, there are very few stream sinks and inlets for water to get from the surface into the cave. Most of the water sinks in this very northern part 
where the sandstone cap has been removed. Focusing in on the catchment for Shannon Pot, the source of the Shannon. First of all, we have a, a local catchment that extends approximately six kilometers from the resurgence. This includes new, numerous stream sinks and potholes, and also includes Shannon Cave. Further east, we have potholes in the East Kilka area, including pigeon pots, and these have been proven to drain to Shannon Pot. Interestingly, for the groundwater to get from Pigeon Pot all the way over to Shannon Pot, we have to drain six or seven kilometers through the limestone aquifer where it's underneath the sandstone cap. Now, of all the cave discoveries in the Kulka Karst, perhaps the most significant is the discovery of Shannon Cave by the Rayfield Group in 1980. The Rayfield Group were exploring a stream sink, this location here called Polar Honey and they managed to squeeze their way through some pretty tight, arduous, quite nasty cave passage. Following the water, they eventually broke out into a large passage here. Now this is the mainstream passage of Shannon Cave. At the same time as the Rayfair group were exploring the cave, John Gunn was undertaking tracer tests in the area. And from the exploration and the tracer tests, it became pretty clear that Shannon Cave was part of a much larger cave network and the drainage to that network was extensive. Between 1980 and 1995, the Rayfad group explored a substantial part of the cave system, getting as far downstream as this point here. Now in 1995, unfortunately, the entrance to the cave collapsed, which meant that nobody could explore the cave system. In 2004, long-term dig by the Shannon group broke back into Shannon Cave. And so since 2004, caves have been back in the cave and exploring it. Now the cave itself is quite a, a complex combination of cave passages. It has multiple streams coming in, uh, which all flow to a central mainstream passage. But one of the characteristics of the cave pretty much throughout is that you've often got quite a high sequence of passages above the active streamway. In places, the passageway is quite narrow, but very tall and quite sinuous. In other places, the passages are much wider. You have a lot of collapse associated with them from whilst they've been developing. But this vertical range in the cave is, is quite unusual for Shannon Cave, and it is an indication that the cave has perhaps evolved over quite a long period of time as the passages have cut down and incised, becoming these quite characteristic canyon shapes. As I mentioned previously, Shannon Cave is located almost entirely below a sandstone cap, and this prevents recharge from getting in to the cave passage. The runoff on the surface simply can't penetrate through the sandstone and runs off further downslope to where it gets the limestone. So we don't get any stalactites or stalagmites occurring in this part of the cave because simply recharge can't get through from the surface protected by that sandstone cap. So it's quite characteristic of Shannon Cave to have, when you, especially when you go into the sandstone cap, you just don't see any of the spill of them. As I mentioned, some of the passages are quite sizable in places passage width exceeds 20 meters and often the actual passage height exceeds 20 meters also. When you get passages of this size there's often quite a lot of collapse from the roof on the ground and you can see in this chamber here large angular limestone boulders that have fallen from the roof as the cave has developed and stream has undercut them. Now in terms of hydrology there are multiple small streams that enter Shannon Cave and these combined form a quite substantial mainstream passage. The first stream that enters the cave system is over here on the eastern side, and this is the Tullyard stream, which sinks down a 33 meter deep pothole into the cave system and can be followed for part of the way. And then it can be it's rejoined in the head of this passage here. After a short while, 
there's a small streamlet that comes in. So the passage is gaining in flow all the time. And then at this point here, we have the honey stream entering. Now this is quite a substantial stream and the flow in the passage picks up instantly at this point, this confluence. And that water flows downstream through quite sinuous passages all the way down to this point here, which is referred to as Mistake Junction. And this is where the mainstream passage joins with Mistake Passage. And at this point, the flow in the river in the mainstream passage doubles as there's a, this is a quite a sizable inlet. There's quite a lot of water coming in through Mistake Passage. And that water continues downstream. There are very few um, in, inlets or streams joining the cave system down gradient from here but the flow is quite substantial following Mistake Passage with those two tributaries uniting. Now Mistake Passage is worthy of further note because this is where the water from Pigeon Pot, which is 6.81 kilometers further east-southeast, that's where this water comes in. And this trace has been repeated on multiple occasions um, and it's been proven to have fairly fast flow path to get to this point. It travels the 6.81 kilometers in three days and three hours, which is a, a rough average linear velocity of just over 100 meters per hour, just to give you an idea of how fast the water will flow in cave systems such as this. Continuing on downstream, the mainstream passage enters a sump, a flooded section of passage at this point here. This was the limit of exploration by the Rayfield group. Um, and at that point, the cave passage was 3.5 kilometers long. The Shannon group have been resurveying the cave since 2004, and that cave survey is now at 8.5 kilometers long. So an additional five kilometers of passage has been found. This includes the passage downstream from this point here, but also a number of high level passages and a number of tributaries that are coming into the mainstream passage. The current limit of exploration is a sump, this location here. And from this point, the water has been traced to Shannon Pot Rising, which is a further 2.21 kilometers west southwest. Now the water gets from the terminal sump to Shannon Pot relatively quickly. It takes 12 hours for the water to get to the sump. Um, considering the distance, that's an average linear velocity of approximately 200 meters per hour, which is very high in some of the, one of the highest um, flow, uh, average linear velocity flows that we've recorded in the Coca Cost. Now, at Shannon Pot Rising, water upwells from a depth into this pool and then flows down the channel behind and below the bridge. You can see in the distance there. This photograph is taken in low flow. You can see the surface is quite calm and the water level is fairly low. But during storm events and particularly intense storm events, the water level in this pond rises substantially and it becomes very turbulent with the water flowing off down the channel beyond it. Now it almost fills that channel so you can see the water level would rise by nearly two meters in those big storm events. Now we've proven comprehensively that the catchment to Shannon Pot Rising, the source of the River Shannon, is quite extensive. In fact, it extends as far as 11 kilometers away to Pigeon Pot in the east and locally, it has a, a wide catchment that includes multiple caves, including Shannon Cave, as well as other sinks and potholes. Now, in more recent times, we've been focusing on the northern part of the catchment. Uh, one cave in particular, Paul Lingossen Cave, has been known for, for many decades, but it has a particularly complex, complex hydrology. It has multiple um, streamways. Um, and further to this, in the last three or four years, a number of new potholes have been discovered in the area of the Burren Forest. And we've included Polygossen and these potholes in the Burren Forest to the water tracing program to work out how they fit in with the catchment divide between Shannon Pot 
and the water that drains northwards to the River Erne. Now part of the problem with working out where the flow paths go to is that although we have caves in the area, you can't necessarily follow the pathway, follow the flow in the, the underground streams all the way down. Quite often the caves get very small, very tight, and you just can't progress any further. So we've been using water tracing, which is using colourful fluorescent dyes to work out where those waters come back out on the surface. But also, as you'll be seeing from the tracer tests we're doing today, quite often the caves themselves have multiple streamways and it's quite difficult often working out which streamway drains from which part of the surface. So part of the test today is to try to work out a particular flow path from a cave entrance, a cave stream sink at Polnagossen, which is just a kilometre away from me here, and we're going to see how far we can follow that streamway into the cave, but also use dye tracing to work out where that water comes out on the surface. Now there are multiple entrances to this cave, but unfortunately at the moment there's only one that you can get into, and that's the one you're seeing in front there, on the right. Other entrances, like the lower one, which you can see in front of yourself now, have filled in over the years. And sadly, they've been filled in with a lot of refuse that has been dumped at the location. And that's been a particular problem with this cave. We've had a, a lot of historical dumping uh, over the, probably the last 100 years and it means that there's a lot of rubbish is built up at the entrance. And unfortunately, every time we get a storm event, every time we get runoff, this rubbish gets washed into the cave. Uh, the rubbish is, the most recent rubbish is bin bags and the like, but a lot of the older rubbish is bottles, glass, cans, tins, and the like of it. And you can imagine that these sort of products, some of them are inert, but a lot of them are slowly rusting and rotting. And there's a real worry about the water quality uh, in the streamway that goes into this particular cave. Just to give you an idea of the amount of rubbish that's been dumped in this cave entrance over the years, you can see from the footage here, there's some of the more recent waste, but in some places, the rubbish is built up to one metre or even two metres thick. And as you can imagine, when we get a storm event, a lot of this gets mobilised and washed straight into the cave. This is one of the other entrances to the cave. It's another one that you, you can't actually access at the moment from the amount of rubbish that's been dumped. But uh, it's a particular problem for Polnagossen and also it's one of the reasons why we are focusing on this particular cave for the dye tracing. Uh, quite simply we want to find out where the water that's sinking at this cave entrance, where does that water go to? Because you can imagine with this amount of rubbish that the water is seeping through, flowing through, mobilising. There are some serious questions about pollution at any of the springs or risings that the water will drain to. So this project isn't just about water tracing, it's also about vulnerability of groundwater. If we zoom into this area in particular, we can see here we have Polygossum Cave, which drains to Barren Rising. We've also got Shannon Cave, which drains to Shannon Pat Rising. Now there are multiple other cast features in the area. And all of these have been traced over the last 20 to 30 years as well. In particular, at the moment, we are interested in two new potholes that are located in, in the Burren Forest. And these are the two potholes that we've been focusing on. If we draw on the tracer lines where we've proven connections from stream sinks to risings, you can see that the northern of these features in the Burren Forest has been traced barren, but the southern one 
has been traced to Shannon Pot. And this confirms our understanding that the catchment divide does cut right through the middle of the Burren Forest. And that has allowed us to refine the catchment boundary between Shannon and Urn and marking it in as such. And as you can see, these potholes are very close to the divide. Now, I mentioned also that we've been doing some repeat tracing tests in Polnigossen Cave. Just as a reminder, Polnigossen Cave has been proven to drain to Barren Rising. This is a survey of Polnigossen Cave. As you can see, compared to Shannon Cave, Polnigossen Polygossen is much shorter in length. It's under two kilometers long. And most of the cave is filled with mud banks and mud deposits. But from the entrance, you can follow surface water stream for a reasonable length through the entrance series and down to where the waterfall cascades down into this chamber. Now in the bottom of this chamber, the water disappears into the floor where there are boulders and can't be followed. Elsewhere in the cave, there is a small streamway that comes in in the southeastern corner and drains through this series of passages here before exiting. And this is the current limit of, of exploration. There's no dye tracing being done to determine where this water comes from nor where it goes to. And that's part of the, the research we're doing at the moment, which we'll talk about shortly. There's a third area where there's water in the cave, and this is near the northern extent of the cave here, where there's a static sump, essentially a pond of water that doesn't move. A few photographs of Polnigossen Cave. From the cave of the standing there, you can see how muddy the cave is. And in fact, when you get your eye in, you can see that the floor is mud and you can see where the mud is extending up the sides of the passage. Now, although we have some stalactites growing down from the roof at this point, there is the remnants of mud in the ceiling and the sides indicates that at some point this entire cave was filled with mud and it's only been cleared of mud where a stream has reactivated and washed it out. So here we have a sequence of the passage being filled with mud, stream washing the mud away and stalactites forming. Here's another great photograph from Parlingossum Cave. And in this one, you can clearly see that the floor is a very large mud bank. And that mud bank has stalactites deposited on top. So the stalactites post-date the mud in the cave. Interestingly, if you look at the roof, you'll see some quite interesting structures. These are anastomoses, and these structures form in the cave when you get these mud banks filling the cave. And when water starts moving on top of the mud, it dissolves upwards into the roof and develops channel structures. And that's what we have here. Again, putting together the sequence of the cave, the anastomoses have formed, and then subsequently, stalactites have started forming, dripping down in here. So the mud in the cave predates the stalactites and stalagmites. And in this particular case, the mud banks are still being eroded away by streams. Today, we're getting ourselves set up for the next sequence of water tracing that we'll be undertaking. The program will be going on for the next two or three weeks. And the intention is to inject dye into the stream sink that goes to Polnigossen and also the two potholes in the Burren Forest. Now we'll be placing field fluorometers at both Barren Rising and Shannon Pot Rising so that we can see where the traces go to. To give us a clearer picture on the hydrology of Polnigossen Cave, in addition to a field fluorometer going at Barren Rising, we're going to place one in the further reaches of Polnigossen in this streamway here. Now, this will record the fluorescence of the water quality when we're 
doing the dye traces and it'll identify if the dye we're putting in at the stream sink for Polygossen or indeed the two three stream sinks in Burren Forest flow through this pathway onto the cave. But the first thing we have to do is get the fluorometer into the cave. Right, that's everything ready, we're good to go. So we're about to start the tracer test. It's worth, say, it's worth pointing out again, just that these are environmental dyes. And although they are highly visible when you put them in the water to start with, they disperse very quickly. And the quantity of dye that we're using is specifically designed and calculated so that when it comes out in the resurgence, it's not visible. We can see here that the stream is washing the dye along its length and it comes to this point here and it all sinks underground into the crack in the limestone being solutionally enlarged and below us here we have a cave, Palming Austin Cave and the water comes in through the roof in the entrance series and we can follow it on 
for about 100 meters before it sinks into the ground again at the bottom of the big chamber. So there goes the dike. We're now going to go into the cave and see how far we can follow it. Right, so looking back, looking back at the cave survey, this is where the field thermometer was installed, where it was uh, logging away in that further streamway. And a week after that installation, we injected the green fluorescein dye into that stream sink, and we were able to follow it through the cave to this point here where it disappeared into the floor. Now, we also placed a fluorometer at Baron Rising. And this is a trace, a download from that fluorometer. And you can see here that the background fluorescence for, for fluorescein was recorded for four days. And then suddenly we got a big spike in the signature for fluorescein dye. And this is a record of the, the dye coming through from the Polygossen sink to barren rising. It took four days, three hours and five minutes, which is relatively slow for cast in the, the Kulka area, bearing in mind that this is a, a um, velocity of, of 20 to 30 meters per hour, uh, whilst we were achieving 100 to 200 meters per hour in, in Shannon Cave. It's also worth noting that there's always a level of, of background fluorescence in the waters emerging just a nature of the, the organics that are in the water from the, the peaty catchments that they're in. But you'll notice the difference from before and after the trace. Well, during the trace, there was a, a rather large flood pulse and that diluted the background fluorescence quite substantially, which is why it's lower at the end than it was at the start here. Now the tracer test turned out to be quite a dynamic test because although we started off in quite low flow conditions the storm event and the melting of snow which occurred shortly there afterwards led to a quite a lot of water going into the cave in a pretty short period of time and in fact the cave flooded so we thought we were going to be doing a relatively straightforward low flow test um, but it turned out to be a test during a storm event now as expected the tracer went from the stream sink to barren rising. As we've proven on multiple tests before, all of which were during low flow. However, when we downloaded the fluorometer from Shannon Park Rising, well, we detected fluorescein there also. 
Previously, we'd not detected fluorescein at Shannon Pot. But as I said, all the previous traces were done under relatively low flow. So here we have an unusual result and a positive test at both Barron rising and Shannon Pot rising. Now, during the same storm event, we undertook trace tests in the two potholes in the Burren Forest. The northern pothole, which had previously drained to Barron, well, that also drained to Shannon Pot Rising. And furthermore, the pothole, the southern pothole, well, it had previously drained to Shannon Pot Rising, but this time it drained to Barron Rising. So here we have three potholes, three stream sinks, all of which drained to two risings in particularly high storm events. The big question is, what changes in Polnagossan Cave between low flow and high flow? How come at low flow, the sinking stream only drains to barren rising, yet during high flow, it drains to barren rising and Shannon Pot rising? Now, during low flow, the extent of water in the cave is actually quite limited. We can follow the water coming into the entrance series and down to waterfall chamber where it's lost in the floor. But the rest of the cave is fairly dry, really. It's very muddy. There are mud banks all the way through. And then we have a static sump, the northern part, and we have this streamway in the further southeast corner. Now, we have been fortunate enough to see the cave in relatively high flow as well. The hydrology of Polnagossan Cave changes completely during a storm event, and the more severe the storm event, then the more dramatic the change. The amount of water sinking into the cave increases substantially, and the streamway feeding down into waterfall chamber carries a lot of flow. At a stage in the flood at Pulse, the infiltration capacity in the base of the chamber is overwhelmed and the water level starts to back up in the chamber, forming a substantial lake. At a high elevation, the water then overflows from waterfall chamber and we get water flowing down through these passages that are normally dry and over and these go all the way through to the further streamway. At the same time we have flooding in this normally part, dry part of the cave, we also get flooding in the central part of the cave and the water level backing up here causes water levels to rise all the way up into mud chamber which floods and the water rising here flows through the cave passage that's normally dry and it drains through trench hall and it also goes off to the southeastern streamway. So during storm events and particularly large storm events, we can get water overspilling from waterfall chamber and flooding a substantial part of the cave and linking that water into the further streamway. So that explains a bit more on the hydrology of Polnagossan Cave and in particular showing the difference between low flow and high flow, and in particular those high flows due to intense storm events where we can have overflow occurring so that water that would normally drain to barren rising overflows and drains across the catchment divide and onto Shannon Pot rising. So you might be asking, why do we still have a question mark at the downstream end of the further streamway. Surely this has to go to Shannon Park Rising. Well, the fluorometer that we placed in the cave will provide the answers to that question. However, because the cave is currently still flooded, we haven't been able to get it out yet. We had a trip into the cave just a couple of days ago to recover the fluorometer, and unfortunately, this section was still flooded. As you'll see from the, the footage following, the, the water in the cave is much more substantial during storm events than it was during the first footage, which was during low flow. Um, but we'll be back in the cave in the next week or two 
we'll get the logger recovered, we'll download the data, and then we'll update all of the analyses accordingly.